Welcome, everybody. It's time once again for the next chapter with Charlie Hedges. As he explores turning the page on his life and yours. Hey, Charlie. Hi, Paul. As always, it's nice to be here with you in the new production studio of OC Talk Radio. I'm, I'm, I'm getting to love this place, man. Are you, you didn't like it at first because it was orange and it was bright. Well, I didn't say I didn't like it. I just said it was orange <laughs> and bright. But that was that was not non judgmental. That was valueless. Orange County Talk Radio has got to be orange. Yeah, it's it's orange. <laughs> you know, you know, Paul. Today's show is uh, today's show will be fun. I'm titling it the the adventure called life because this is how our special guest today lives his life. As an ongoing adventure, as a personal development coach, Nate Johnson genuinely lives life. Check it out. He's an American, an American city guy turned white water rafting guide in New Zealand, a rancher in the Australian outback, a manager at Inc. Magazine, and an SEO business executive. I, I, you know, and I think he was in the carnival business, but we're going to talk about that and find out about that for sure. Um, I, I'm truly excited to have Nate Johnson on the show today. In spite of our more than 30-year difference in age, Nate and I are indeed kindred spirits that believe life is for living, not for watching. Uh, Nate is a mindset and personal development coach. He is the co-author of a book, The Successful Mind, a speaker, adventurer, and a self-proclaimed, I love this, imperfect stoic, as if there was anything else other than an imperfect stoic, just as the stoic. Um, His primary goal is to help clients live, not merely exist. So with that, let's get Nate Johnson on the show. Hey, Nate. Welcome to the next chapter with Charlie. Thank you very much, Charlie. Great to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. You know, as as we were getting to know each other, and I was looking at some of the stuff you wrote, I was so struck by our mutual interest in the oddest of characters. You, you know, <laughs> we, we start with the poet Charles Bukowski, the singer-songwriter, actor Tom Waits, writer Anais Nin, and then you have to add David Boy, Alan Watts, Tim Ferriss, Ryan Holiday. I mean, I don't know if anybody else that likes all those people at the same time. And then we have the we can't leave out the Stoics and especially Marcus Aurelius. And we mm. both agree that the meditations of Marcus is, you know, a life changing read. That's a, that's pretty striking that we have that many things to, to in common. I know. I was struck by that too. And I loved how you, you mentioned in the story that uh you read Bukowski to your wife, I believe, in the voice of uh, Tom Waits, and <laughs> and there is an actual video of Tom Waits reading Bukowski. Uh, so it's fun to be able to share share resources that we both found we both liked. You know what's interesting about that, Nate? I listened to that. You sent me a, a clip of that, and, and I listened to it. And I have to tell you, when I read the poem to my wife, I think I did better than Tom Waits. I did a better Tom Waits than Tom Waits did. <laughs> I have no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> he has such a uh, iconic voice. Are you familiar with him, Paul? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. What's that? He lived in San Peter, where I lived in, in down in the funky bars and all that stuff. That get great movie, Barfly, with uh, Mickey Rourke in it. Yeah, about Bukowski's life. Tom Waits was in that movie. No, Tom Waits wasn't in it, but Tom oh, Waits. Oh yeah, yeah right. oh that bar that 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 it was a it was um, um what's his name I'm picturing him right now Mickey Mickey Rourke yeah. Mickey Rourke yeah. yeah yeah great film and it was great film on Charles Bukowski the drunken poet and um, mm. he, he's just brilliant don't you think Nate Yeah yeah it's I I love his um you know he I, as I told you I was like I have a soft spot for old codgers. And well, you, you got two of them in the room right here. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just love the way he talks. I love his his cynicism, but also the the way he writes about hope and you know reinvention and and it. I think he's beautiful. I I love him. That's yeah. You know, after after all the stuff that I took a look at, you know, my my question is is where to begin this discussion today because. 
there's there are so many entry entry points, but I was thinking, why don't we just start with the title of the episode and I wonder what comes to your mind when you think of the adventure called life? Hmm. Well, I know you weren't well, ready for I'll, that one. I, I, it was a no, surprise. I love it. I, I love that question. I, I'll start with, I guess the, the best way for me to start off with is, is where it first hit me that I thought life could be different. And that was as a kid. I grew up in a small town in Nebraska, um, very homogenous, not a whole lot changed. And, you know, I just wanted to have an adventure. I wanted to have a story to tell. Uh, and there was just this feeling that was welling up. And there, there was no way that I couldn't have done what I did and uh, have done and had an adventure. It was just in me. It was what I needed to do. So it wasn't like it was a struggle to be able to set off an adventure. I was just waiting for the chance to get out of the house. Really, really. And, yeah. and in, 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 I imagine in Midwest living, I mean, Nebraska is considered Midwest, is it not? It is. It is the most mid of the West. It's the mid of the Midwest. Yeah. You know, and there, you know, there is that, that sort of homogeneity and, and, and that homogeneity is expected. So you had to be sort of a, almost a rebel in your quest for adventure. Would that, would that not be true? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I relished in it though. You know, I loved, (laughs) I loved the idea of being seen as a little bit weird. Um, (laughs) you know, as, as a kid, I think a lot of us are seen as weird. I, you know, I hit like puberty at nine. So already I had the education of being seen as kind of weird. And yeah, once I, once I realized that I would be able to actually do the things that were in my imagination, um, I got really excited, and by the time I turned 18 or 19, it, it would just seemed very natural for me to, to head out. There was really no other choice than to, than to get out of the Midwest. Nothing against the Midwest. I just no, no, I needed an adventure. You, you, you know, that's, once again, something we, I keep finding these things we have in common, and that I frequently tell people, if you call me weird, you have just offered me a compliment. Yeah, and and I love that that is actually seen more as cool these days. There's so many weird people that get to put their own stuff up on online, uh, and being a nerd is almost seen as something cool now. Just being back cool. When I was, yeah. yeah, when I was a kid, that was not the case. <laughs> no, no. And when I was a kid, it just wasn't even the case. You were just flat and oddball. We didn't even have the word nerd, but it was... <laughs> it was an odd ball. So yeah. you, you know what I what I what I'd like to talk about before we get really into the the meat and depth of of your coaching and how you serve people and what's in your mind. Mm-hmm. I really want to know about your life down under. How how in the okay. world did you end up in Australia and New Zealand? Sure. Well, I um, let's see here. When I was in college, I really wanted to get a fun job in between semesters. So I went up to Northern California, and I trained to be a rafting guide on the American River. And everybody that I worked with was international, especially from down in New Zealand and Australia and South America, because they would just travel with the summers. So I knew a bunch of Kiwis, and then when I graduated... um, you know, I stayed in Thousand Oaks, California to make some money for a year. And then I was like, okay, I'm out of here. There's a little bit of sadness in there. Um, uh, I, my best friend and I were going. And three days after we bought our ticket, which was on July 1st, 2008, uh, he was hit by a truck uh, and killed instantly um, when he was walking across the street on July 4th. Uh, so I went by myself. Um, and I got a job as a rafting guide with one of my friends from California or who I worked with in California. And do you know that, have you ever seen Lord of the Rings? 
Yes, of course. So Sauron, not Saruman, not like the big, big baddie, but the evil wizard, uh, where his castle is in the movie is actually a river valley. It's not grass and stuff. And that is where we worked. So we took jet boats up the river, up this emerald, emerald colored braided river. And then we took out the boats, we blew them up, and then we took our customers down the river. It was, uh, when I was on the boat every day, I would just think, I can't believe I'm being paid to do this. I can't believe I'm here and I can't believe I'm being paid. Um, that was, that was my first job down under. And, and you took that, that was a, that was a summer job for you in, in Northern California. Mm -hmm. That was, that was your introduction to that. Yes. In between junior and senior year of college. Oh, just one summer. And then you, you became a guide right after that. Uh, A guide in New Zealand. uh, Yeah. A couple of years later, a couple of summers later. Oh, that's how how fun. So so you spent some time in New Zealand. Now, mm-hmm. I have to ask, you know, a lot of people say New Zealand is one of the finest countries in the world to visit. Do you agree? Oh, yes, it is. Uh, it's long. It's a lot bigger than you think when you're traveling by car. Uh, but, oh, my gosh, the diversity. You don't even want to shut your eyes if you're the passenger in the car because, you know, you could literally miss you know, there's, there's glaciers in the middle of the jungle. There, You know, you could miss something beautiful if you just fell asleep for an hour. It's it's an incredible spot. And the Modi culture and the uh, New Zealand people are incredible. I love that. Yeah, that I, you know, I hear the same thing from, from anybody that's gone. They, you know, and, we, and my wife and I have no plans to go to New Zealand. And I wonder why every time I, I hear about New Zealand, I, I hear you've, you've got to go there. Uh, <laughs> you do. Uh, I would say. I would say so. Um, and so, so from New Zealand, you headed off to. How did you end up in the outback in Australia? I could see how you ended up in Australia because you know they're neighbors, but in the outback of Australia. <laughs> yeah. So um, I was in New Zealand, and I wanted to go to Southeast Asia. Well, this was during the recession, and so not only was money you know, not prevalent for a young person or for many people, but also um, the New Zealand dollar was really low. So the Australian dollar was higher. And if you're between the ages of 18 and 31, you can get a visa to New Zealand, Australia and work there for a year with no qualifications. You don't have to go through any process. You just fill out a form online and you can just go. So, I had met this couple and we're still amazing friends to this day uh, and 12 years later. Um, And they were from Perth, kind of the San Diego uh, of Australia. I didn't realize Perth was that, that 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 was what was known of Perth. I know it's kind of one of the southernmost cities. Is that not right? Yeah. I mean, it's in pretty much the same location as San Diego is in America. Uh, you know, just that lower southwest corner. Um, and the temperature is just like San Diego. Um, I mean, so much of I don't know if anyone's ever called it <laughs> the San Diego of Australia, but to give you an idea of where it is in the country and the temperature, I mean, it's, it's the vibe is just like San Diego. So um, then to go into the outbook, outback, you had to travel somewhat north, right? Yeah. So, so I had met this couple uh, on Halloween, we knew each other for a night and they said, Hey, if you're ever in Australia, give us a shout. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm going to take you up on that. So I went and stayed with them for a month while I looked for jobs. Finally found a job online as a house girl in the outback. Well, if I was going to be in Australia, I want an Australian job. And if I had to swallow my pride and be a house girl and just do cooking and cleaning, I was going to do it as long as I got to live in the outback. So I called them up and told them I wanted the position. And they said, well, it's already been taken by a girl. Uh, so that's not available. But our son might need help as a, uh, as a rancher. Are you interested in that? And, of course, I was like, yeah. And so they said, well, do you know how to fence? No. Do you know how to muster? Never heard of what mustering was. 
can you ride a motorcycle? I hadn't ridden a motorcycle for like 10 years or something, but I said, yes. So they flew me out there and all of a sudden I was a cattle rancher in the middle, middle of nowhere. A Northern musterer Territory, and Texas, a fencer. Australia. Yeah. To must to muster cattle is just to herd cattle. That's, oh, that's okay. I mean. And you did that by motorcycle, not by horse. That's correct. Yes, I did it by motorcycle, not by horse. Uh, we had motorcycles, four wheelers. We had steel plated trucks. Um, I mean, it looked like Mad Max out there. It was just a bunch of people. And we had uh, aboriginals on our crew from a nearby village. And then, um, and then we had like the family who owned the ranch. And that was pretty much it. How fun. And a helicopter. And a helicopter. That's that is fun. And so so did you use the helicopter? Yeah. So basically, to give you a, a quick synopsis, uh when you're herding cattle, uh mustering cattle, um the helicopter takes off early in the morning, rounds the cattle from the mountains and stuff. There are mountains in the middle of the outback, small small mountains, I guess. Uh and these cattle just live you know, wide open on this huge, huge plot of land. Like you could drive two hours and still be on the same land. They drive them out of the mountains. And then about one o'clock, he'd call us up on the radio and said, okay, I'm coming your way. And you get in your, get on your motorcycle and your truck and you drive out and there'd just be this wall of wild cattle headed your way. And then your job was to, was to bring them in to the paddock that you'd built so it, it's it's a whole different a whole different version of cowboy than what we think of cowboy. <laughs> yes, there there are the traditional um, horse uh, cattle ranchers, but um, yeah, it seems that motorcycles and motor vehicles are more efficient, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I can see how. Um, tell me, what what did you what what do you think were your your key learnings from your your time down way down south on the other side down under what did what what did you what did you walk away with as life's messages Boah, that's a good question um number one if you're going to do something physically dangerous do it while you're young and don't have a family uh <laughs> makes it a lot makes it a lot easier and you don't worry about anybody but yourself I would say one, like, you know, so often, this is kind of a bigger life lesson, The so often we're, we're fearful of uncertainty, um, that we don't try anything. But I learned that, that just with some, the willingness to actually try something that most people don't can get you really, really far. Couple that with a little confidence, um, willingness to learn, willingness to look silly, and, um, some, you know, the ability to get along with people, you can really do a ton. You know, you can do so much cool stuff that you didn't thought you'd do, but you, you just have to, you know, you have to ask for what you want. Um, that was huge for me. And it was huge to know that life didn't have to, you know, be like they, they tell you in kind of an institution uh, that, you know, you have to go get a job and then you get married and then you blah, 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 which is fantastic. For, for a lot of people, but if you don't want to do that, you don't have to do that. You, you can you can do some, some pretty cool stuff. Now, where did you get that? I mean, that is such a unique, that is such an adm- admirable, fun. I mean, for some people it's not admirable, but, you know, for me, that's admirable and fun. <laughs> where, where did you get that attitude? Did you get that from your father, your mother? Or is that parental, or did that just come from reading books and longing to do something fun? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, my parents weren't international travelers. They had been to Rome. Uh, they'd been to Rome and Venice. But they hadn't really been anywhere besides that when my sister and I were kids. And now, you know, we've been all over the world. My sister lives in the country of Jordan. She married our tour guide. So she's very adventurous in her own right. Um, I, I don't know. It was just this inner urge. And having parents that were okay or not, not only okay, but supportive just as long as I could support myself. 
as long as I could financially support myself, they supported almost everything that I did, you know? Um, and that was very lucky, but it was just an inner urge. I don't know where it came from. Yeah, it's an but, inner um, urge. You, you, yeah. you know, pardon me for interrupting, but, you know, it's, it's, it's also there, there had to be a freedom with your parents. And I think this is a, a message to all parents that there's a freedom to allow the child to pursue passions rather than follow the American dream of what you what you just said, go to college, get married, get a rich job, and buy a house and a Mercedes Benz, and then your life is complete, and you have an entirely different paradigm than that. And, and it, it appears as if that came to you from youth. Yeah, you know, it really did. As soon as I... As soon as, I mean, I had always wanted to uh, just get out ever since I was a little kid. Um, and get out doesn't mean necessarily get out of the Midwest, but get out and see things. Um, and by the way, I, I would, you know, a house and a Mercedes Benz are, are fantastic, but I never wanted to make that the end, if that makes sense. I wanted to, yeah, just see stuff and uh, have an adventure and really have a story. And for some reason as a kid, I always thought of myself, as when I'm a grandfather, I want my grandkids to be sitting around and I want to be able to tell them cool stories. And that was a clear image in my mind. And um, so I just set out to do that. So I imagine you have you have a, a pocket full of cool stories. Yeah, I think I do. Um, I was almost killed by a boat that I was riding in. It chopped up the back of my leg. and It uh, chopped up the back of your leg? Yeah, and you fell out and it ran over you or something. Yeah, a wave knocked me out and the boat couldn't turn off the the person couldn't turn off the engine before it ran over me. And, oh my um, goodness! Yeah, but it that taught me independence. It taught me <laughs> like that was the first time I ever think I put stoicism into practice. You know, I couldn't think about how I was going to die. I just had to think. Okay, tell myself funny jokes and sing songs. And accept that this was a situation I was in and just stay alive through it. You know, if people say that, were you scared and stuff? I didn't have any time to be scared. You, you just got to almost be delusional sometimes. And that's true in a lot of areas of life I've found is it's okay to have a healthy sense of delusion just as long as it's directed in the, in the right place. Because that can really get you far too. Doing something that other people say you can't do but you do it because the risk is not huge um, for most things. Most of the time you're not facing your own mortality. But, but yeah, you just, you just do it. And that, that's how I felt when I was in <laughs> trying to stay alive is, is I just was delusional. I was like, I'll, I'll be okay. So. Yeah. I, you, you know, I, you know, I, I you, certainly the word delusional works for you, but it, but it's, it comes to me that there is a sense of, um, of this creativity and of this de- desire for something new. And, you know, I'm a real strong believer in archetypes, and you certainly have the archetype of explorer, adventurer, and that always seeking something something new. Would would you say that's, a, that's part of who you are? Yes, yes. And that's not to say that I don't get, if I get comfortable I will look back over the past year and be like, oh, I was, I was way too comfortable. I, I need to mix it up a little bit. So it's not to say that it stays with me all the time, but every once in a while when I check up with myself, it, you know, I remember, oh, yeah, I, I, uh, I need to add some novelty. I need to mix these things up. That's funny. I, you know, I had, I had the same experience at, at a very young age. Right out of college, I hitchhiked around the country for really um, yeah three guy can you believe this this was in 1970 i don't think it was 69 i think it was 70 with uh three guys uh oh. three long hairs um, <laughs> um three backpacks and i carried a guitar and we actually had people that picked us up and we went wow. from, we went from la as far as toronto canada and new york uh-huh. and then back again we were gone for for three months and it was just it was you know you can imagine three hippies what it would be like that was wow 
and 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 then and then I I I sort of had a a normalized life. Uh, although you know I've had seven careers, so I don't think it's really normal. No, um, I don't think so either. But but then after my my son went into his career, that's when mm-hmm. my travel began again, and I've probably since that time been to twenty five countries or more. Just wow, you, you know, and then. Going, I, I would go with my wife, or I, either my wife, or I would, I would um, just travel through Europe, you know, on walking on foot. I wasn't backpacking, but you know, I would stay in Airbnbs and just visit different cities and different museums. I'm a museum nut, art museum nut, and <laughs> and just visit museums in crazy places, and and always trying, you know, something new. Now, now, there's something you you had mentioned that that I wanted to get into, and I'm thinking, yeah, we can we can do this, and then we'll take a break. Um, okay, cool. You know, we both have have um, 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 sort of allegiances to Stoicism, and mm-hmm. uh, rather than um, go deeply into to Marcus Aurelius and Seneca and the uh-huh. Stoics in general, we had chatted, and I want to discuss one of the, um, I, I don't know if it's primary, well, it really is one of the primary um, precepts of Stoicism, and that is that is the notion of death and mm-hmm. how death serves us in life and how you know, there is a certain focus on death that is very helpful. It's not, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not, it, it, you know, it's not, um, um, what is the word I'm thinking of? It's, it, you know, it's not morose. Morose, thoughtful. exactly. Thank you. Thank you. But, but maybe you could explain, because you had talked about how important death was, thinking about death and pondering death, how that impacted your life. It, it, Tell me about that. I'd be more than happy to. And by the way, uh, I wish you could have seen the smile that I had when you were telling me about all your travels after your son has left. I absolutely love when people are just like, well, I'm just going to take an adventure at any point in their life. So that I'm so excited. I'd love to discuss that more at some point. Yeah, that was in, um, my, that was in my 60s. That's incredible. <laughs> that reminds me a lot of my folks. So, yeah. When I was, first of all, when I was young, my family loves to talk about death. The Lutheran part of my family, my, my parents, uh, uh, or my dad and his side of the family. But I, I, I was always really put off by it as a kid. I was always thought like, why, why aren't you focusing on living? Why are you focused so much on death? Was this afterlife um, kind of death, or is this? Yeah, it was afterlife kind of death, and... You know, it could have been I was just misunderstanding them because I was so bummed that they were talking about death all the time. Um, and I was a kid. You know, kids don't, kids even in their 20s don't like to think about that stuff all that often. They think they're invincible. And Kids um, in their 70s don't like to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you know, and I was a suicide prevention counselor. And, and so right. even up till then, I would say that, I hadn't fully formed, and who knows if it's fully formed yet, but I uh, um, hadn't fully formed an idea of how beneficial death could be. And here's the reason why I find death to be perhaps the most useful tool I've found to living a big life. And it's, it's kind of holding two thoughts in your head at once. At one point, well, I try to think of it like a uh, like analogy of a drop of water falling into an ocean. Like you yourself are a drop of water, right? And you have this you have this drop that you get to play with. You get to do anything you want with on your way, you know, down. Uh, but when you hit the water, now you are just a part of a massive ocean. And in that way, that's the kind of the way that I see life. Like you get these this body, this mind, this consciousness to play with and do really anything you want with. And it's special because it's rare. This, this one droplet, you know, you will never exist 
ever again. No one ever like you will exist. Even if the, even if you were, you know, had the exact same biology, the experiences you have would, would mean that, that, uh, they would be different. You know, nothing like you will ever exist. You're this singular droplet. So hold that in your head that life is precious because it's rare and that moments that you get to have with people like this moment that we're having now are rare because number one, I don't know if you're going to be here tomorrow. I don't know if I'm going to be here tomorrow, but what I do know is that um, this moment will not happen again. This podcast, this conversation will never happen again. And the death of even this moment makes it so much more vibrant because I get to experience it. But on the other hand, eventually I'm just going to be a bunch of, you know, uh, atoms and things that decompose back into the earth, you know, just like that water droplet hitting the ocean. You're just going to go back to, to form other new droplets. So at that point, don't take life so precious. So it's holding the preciousness of because you're rare with don't worry about, you know, being scared or trying to hold up the status quo or trying to please this person simply to please them because these moments are going to be gone. Like it's your, your, your risk is always at the end. It's just death. You're really not risking any more than that. Um, so at, at one point it's not precious. So it's the duality of, of seeing life as so precious and rare yet not being so scared uh, of life and of certain things and of taking chances because eventually you're going to die and holding the, that duality at the same time uh, is the most powerful thing that I've ever come across in life. And that is without hyperbole. Um, yeah. What my, once my knowledge of death got, got to be in that realm, um, it, it immediately, and I'm, I'm saying like overnight dropped so much of the fear and anxiety that I had previously had. Boy, you know, I, 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 have, a, I have a thousand comments uh, or questions and, and comments. Paul is signaling at me. He wants me to come back and ask and address these comments after a break. Let's so, do it. So let's take a quick break, and we'll be back in like 10 seconds. That's great. and you're listening to the next chapter with Charlie and my guest, Nate Johnson, who is uh, an adventurer, explorer, and a personal coach that can help you pursue life. And as we're calling it, life is an adventure, and and we're calling this adventure that's called life. And that and it, it's very different. I think it's a whole different take on it. On it, that we can say life is an adventure. Let's turn that around and let's make that even stronger that there is an adventure and we call it life. We don't call life the, we don't call life an adventure. We call an adventure life. Um and I, I love that. Yeah, I yeah, so so do I. I I the title came to me as I was writing this and I went, hmm. Um <laughs> you you know when you're talking about death and 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 I, I think of the great philosophers of 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 history and you know they all had skulls human skulls on their desks to Mm. to remind them of death that was a great that was that was a great thing i've wanted a skull for forever now i can buy a fabricated skull for a couple hundred dollars but if you want a real (laughs) skull it's like two grand and (laughs) and i have i have really thought you know my son's a baseball player and makes some money so I thought about mm-hmm. telling my son, what do you want for Christmas? I want a skull, son. I want a real <laughs> human skull that just, you know, th- that just is reminding me of death. Not that, not as a, a for of, you know, something to be, to be feared, but a reality that my time is indeed limited and that I need to live my life at the fullest and every culture 
wants to dictate to its contingency their view of how a life should be lived. And yes. we fortunately, living in the West, we have the opportunity to think out of that box. A lot of places in the world don't have that opportunity as, as widely as we have the opportunity. However, mm-hmm. we're just still so stuck. I love I loved the way you describe college as as institutionalized thinking and and it is it's it's sort of prescripting what what we need what our life needs to look at without really evaluating what are we being called to do by our and not called by some necessarily some higher being or or higher entity but just called by the way we're created called by our DNA that to live you know, I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the word authenticity, but to live, you, you know, I do like it when it's used correctly, that to live authentically with the way we are created. And I think that's mm. what, you're, what you're talking about. And, and what also comes to mind, and I want to say this, try to say, not harbor on this, but, but you know, we're in, in an age of mindfulness, and we're saying you need to be paying attention to the present. But you are talking mm. about mindfulness very differently. You're talking about it sort of on steroids, and that it is a mindful, a pleasurable mindfulness, and it, it's sort of a responsibility, and it's irresponsible not to view it as special and as unique and as, as yours. And as, like you said, even this show we're doing, this conversation we're having, this will be the only time we'll have other conversations, but this is the only time we are going to have this conversation. On, at correct. this time, on this date, you know, and under these conditions, and that it is a time truly to be treasured. And, and if we could view more of our times like that, how much better off would we be, Nathan? Uh, what, what, what do you think? Yeah, well, you know, you say we'll have other conversations. You know, we hope we'll have other conversations. But neither of us knows what's going to happen tonight or immediately following this conversation. And that just goes along with um, reflecting on death and, and, and appreciating that I get to be here with you and that I've even gotten to know you, even for a, a sliver of time if it happens to be that, which obviously I hope it's not, but it makes this moment all that more vibrant. And you were talking about mindfulness and presence. That was something I I always found it difficult to do because I was, I was like, okay, so... What does it mean to be more present? And Alan Watts talks about this. He's like, you know, you strain to love more. You strain to, to you know, be more present. You're, you're like, oh, you're, your body's tensed up. Like, how do I be more present? I have found death to be the answer to that, too, um, because I don't have to strain about being more present with you in this moment. I can just remember, hey, this moment's not going to, last forever in fact it's just flying by and that automatically brings me into being present here without any effort and to treasuring um, this moment to to truly treasure this opportunity yeah yeah just because i know that it will end and that has helped me to be present can you uh, yeah wasn't sure the rest of the question i, I uh, well that was that i forgot that, that was it i think i think we i think we've we've covered death all all we need to but i think we've given i think we've given our audience an idea of it doesn't have to be um morose and no. that it is it is a fact of life and and it is an intentional fact of life that helps us really take advantage of our opportunities but now yeah y- you know if I understand correctly about your profession, is that mm-hmm. you are you help other professionals who are striving to reach? I read that, that are striving to reach their potential. Um, yes. Now, help me here, and and uh, I I've personally not struggled with this, but I know many many who have. Yeah. Help us understand, what if I, Nate, what if I don't even know my potential or have an idea what my potential might be? Because 
it's been told to me by my culture, by my parents, by the people mm. close to me, by everything I read in the newspapers, by all the movies that I watch. You know, there are paradigms that I need to follow, but you are suggesting that my potential is my potential. It is not a cultural abstract. It is something that's very particular to me. Uh, what if I don't even know that? What if I'm, I'm not even sure what my potential is? How, how would you guide me in that? Yeah, that's a great question. And, um, you know, by the way, potential, we often think of like one thing, like, you know, uh, one thing that we had potential, but potential in my mind is really not being afraid anymore. Um, and it's not so much not being afraid, like you won't have moments of fear, but not being afraid is in, if there's something that you really want to do, you can, you normally feel some sort of anxiety come up and that's either anxiety because you haven't done it yet or you feel like you're too late, or it's some sort of anxiety like of, out of uncertainty. You don't know what's going to happen if you do try this. And sometimes it's an anxiety of irresponsibility. You know, what will other people think of me when I do this? When I think of people's potential, I always think of just like, imagine at the end of your life, imagine what you will regret having not done. And if the answer starts to creep into your head, whether it like is loud and explodes and you, you know exactly what it is, or if you, if it's just creeping in there, if you kind of know, start entertaining that because I think that's our potential living, doing the exact thing that we would do if we didn't have any fear of what people thought of us, of uh, the consequences of things like that. And I see that as potential. Now, that's for somebody who doesn't know exactly what they want to do. Those of us who um, know what they want to do, that those same issues come up, except that the people know what it is they want, but they still have these fears that are holding them back. Um, and my personal definition of, well, I don't know, definition of human potential, but it goes along with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It is going beyond ourselves. We have the self-esteem, we have the love from our family, or we've created a friend group uh, that, that loves us. You know, we have our basic needs and stuff like that. And now we are, quote unquote, self-actualizing. We, we are seeking self-development. We're seeking to benefit the world beyond ourselves. Um, and basically, we're seeking not to hold ourselves back at all. So, yeah, potential mirrors... Um, self-restriction in a lot of ways for me. Uh, so what you feel restricted on is probably helping you lead to your potential. Oh, that, that, that it, it really is. The potential is, are you, you know, your, your restrictions can, can also be, you can use them as opportunities. What your, your, your view of these restrictions. Yeah. It's almost like a trigger. You know, when you feel a little yeah. fear, it's probably a trigger to what you want to do. Um, you know, it's easier for some, and it doesn't mean that, that if you're fearful now that you're always going to be fearful. You, it may become a regular habit when you do things that you fear, and then you're starting to reach your potential uh, there. But you can do it little by little, or you can do it in big leaps and bounds. I just hate, really, really, it eats me up when, when I see people not doing things or doing things out of fear. Uh, and it's my job to help clear their windshield uh, so that they can see straight ahead and, and go straight ahead and be bold. Um, yeah, I, I just want people to play play big and not and not play small. I, I love it. You, you know, you know I, I, I looked at, you know, at some of the things that you had written and you talked about... Um, um, what I'm calling roadblocks to your potential or being who you want to be. And you, you listed three, and you know I, we're not going to discuss them individually, but I, I want to sort of approach them um, collectively. And you, you, you set these roadblocks as 
there are, are not roadblocks, but these are ways to overcome roadblocks. Mm-hmm. And that is uh, reframing setbacks, that we mm-hmm. are all going to have setbacks, building emotional resilience, and that we have our fears, our need to be accepted, our need to, to you know, sort of match our neighbors. And the third yeah. one that you had was overcoming mental blocks. And I, I mm. just think those are... Those are areas that you work with in your clients. Is that with your clients? Is that not correct? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, some of the stuff that a lot of the stuff that I teach. In fact, I would say everything that I teach is simple. Uh, it's as simple as stoicism. It's as simple as you know. Good philosophy, I feel, is the philosophy that teaches you how to live a better life. And a lot of the tenets are pretty simple. It might take practice and reinforcements, and in fact, it will. I still have to read, reread stuff all the time. But um, yeah, helping people to overcome those things without having to seek something new every time. You know, I love the idea of self development, but I feel like self help sometimes can be like, hey, we discovered this new thing, and hey, here's this new thing that you have to read. I think it really just comes down to the basics which is why I love Stoicism and uh, practical Eastern philosophy so much because they they always come back to the same basics. And I think if you can try to master those, then you've laid a pretty darn good foundation to live a big life and a happy life. Um, And you were talking about um, adversity and, uh, you know, uh, reframing setbacks. I think it was, it was either Aristotle or Socrates said, uh, Courage is the greatest uh, virtue because it allows for all other virtues. I actually would go a step further, uh, far be it from me, from (laughs) uh, improving upon uh, either of those guys, Aristotle or Socrates. But I would say that if you learn to love the struggle, you won't need as much courage. So if you learn to, like, step into the fear, step into the, uh, you know, the positive anxiety, anxiety of taking a chance. If you learn to love that feeling, then you won't need to pump yourself up as much. And I try to help my clients to do that. You know, I, I, I personally am going through, working through some issues right now, and and I, I'm working with our friend, um, Kameen Samuel, who was on my podcast. Yeah. And, and we're working through difficulties and, and struggles, and I'm coming to this conclusion... Through several readings, I read I read the mystics and and contemplative mm-hmm. and contemplative prayer a lot, and they do talk about struggles. But I was confused, and that I thought that that struggles were were necessary in the advancement of my life, and I think there is some necessity to them, but what we must do, and if we fail to do, we fail that whole process, and that is transforming struggles, mm. and that we need to transform those struggles into, I, I was I was talking to a doctor yesterday, and she was talking, yeah, life throws rocks at us, and it just occurred to me, I had an image that occurred to me and says, you know, our, I think our job is to capture those rocks and polish them into diamonds. That, oh, I like that. That we, we, we take those rocks of difficulty, and we don't live in that difficulty, we don't live in that struggle, but we polish them into, into, into precious actions. And, and, and I think, you know, when you're reframing setbacks, and you're building emotional resilience, and you're overcoming mental blocks, it is... It is many times, it is an act of transformation or, or, or reforming or, or resurrecting from that sort of struggle. Does that, does that resonate with what you're saying? Yeah, I love that a lot. Um, I think that's a really, really beautiful way to put it. Uh, when I think of struggles, the first person that comes to mind is always Teddy Roosevelt. And he had this motto of living the strenuous life. 
And to me, the strenuous part, that, that, that word strenuous, that describes all the adversity, the chosen adversity to go through, but also the things that life throws in your way. But you would think, uh, I'd say most people would think that that, that adversity, that, that strain, that strenuousness of life would be overbearing. But can you, can you think of a more jolly person than Teddy Roosevelt? He was almost like a boy into his old age you know he obviously he was involved in war and he could be very very fiery but what a story that guy has and he just didn't want an easy life he wanted an adventurous life he wanted to go right towards adversity because that was in his control and that's a big stoic thing what is in your control and what is out of your control and if you choose to reframe a situation in a way that it will benefit you or make you stronger or wiser uh, or more charitable. I mean, I, that's how I help people to reframe um, adversity and setbacks. I, I love that. I, 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 I love the verb reframe. And I think we're probably using almost synonymously uh, reframe or transform that, yeah. you, you know, transformation is a reframing of an idea thinking, taking that same idea and using it differently, but only using it for your favor and for the fulfillment of who you are deep inside. That's, uh, that's powerful. So, you know, you know what I want to do? We're, we're coming close to our time here and Mm -hmm. I would like to, I would like to sort of wrap up and, and, and understand your process as you help your clients to live with vigor and to, I think you write, to live and not exist. And yeah. by following social constructs, it is much more existing than living. And it's, it's a checkbox. We, we, you know, if we live by a checkbox, checkbox life, it's a, mm-hmm. it's a very, it's a very boring life to me. I, I, <laughs> I don't, you know, I have certain checkboxes, but they are not about my dreams. They're about of how am I taking care of my family, how am I taking care of my wife and my son, and how am I pursuing my job and doing just, am, am I doing my basic things that I need to do? But when it comes to dream, there are no checkboxes on dreams. I, I really have no checkboxes of countries I need to visit or experiences I need to have because I have so many that it would just, it would be impossible. I just kind of go with my <laughs> gut and whatever is next. So what I would like to know is your process if yeah. if say say I'm that person as I as I come before say I'm a stuck person and mm-hmm. and I have maybe I have an idea of my potential but I fear it because because as we as you talked about uncertainty you know the um, the bad known is always better than a potential unknown. Is it, because uncertainty is so it is so frightening for us that we would rather be certain that it's going to be bad, at least it's predictable, when we need to break out of that. So how would you help me break out of my fear of uncertainty and my need for predictability, which keeps me stuck? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, first of all, most of my clients, I would say all my clients already have, they know what they want or they know the general direction. That, so they have to come to me with something that I can work with because I can't give a dream to somebody. Um, but say that they are coming to me, somebody with a really strong dream or, or a uh, drive, or even, you know, just a kind of knowing where they want to go. Um, I would say that I always try to see that I always try to start with, you know, what do you want? We get that out of the way. And then we start going over their fears, perhaps. And what I'll do is I'll take like a 10,000 foot view. And, and that's like looking at their life and t- almost like a timeline uh, maybe even skipping to the end and looking back, but we'll try to break down what are those fears and are they real fears? 
Like, why is this thing holding you back? Why are you so scared? What are you going to feel if you don't mm-hmm. go after it? And, um, yeah, so I'll try to see him, get him to see the big picture because we've already overcome so many fears. We've already overcome so much uncertainty in our life. Um, like, you can do it. So you have to just kind of reframe, like, what was it like? What, do you, what, do, what does life feel like now? And most of the time, people are like, well, I'm here, I'm alive, I I feel pretty good. It's like, well, yeah, but you are the result of all the uncertainty you stepped into in life. So what makes you think that it's going to be any different in the future? Except if you had done all the things that you fear, you'll probably even be more happier. It's very specific uh, to the person, but I try to take a 10,000-foot view, an eagle's eye view. And to show them that, hey, these fears, these things that you're that uh, are holding you back, they're not real, and and they not um, their consequences that you think they'll have aren't really that big. Um, and I usually will send them a couple things on stoicism, and I'll send them two particular things. One is uh, Helen Keller's uh, paragraph about how right. security is mostly superstition, and then Hunter S. Thompson's essay on security, and. There's another guy, those. Hunter S. Thompson. Is there anybody that we don't read that's obscure? I mean, I love I Hunter S. Thompson. <laughs> yeah, but they had great ideas. I mean, well, you talk about you talk about a guy that that was willing to take risks and do and do whatever. You know, he oh, was a, he was crazy. But he some of his writings are super practical, and the, our value with security and thinking that we can control the future that we think that as humans we somehow have a right to predict what's going to happen in our lives, you know, is, is uh, I would call that delusion. Um, truly. And so I try, truly. I try to get them to be more adventurous. And while they have what's in their control, they should use what's in their control. Because um, if they're always fearing externals, then they'll be in fear their whole life and they'll play small and, Place if they get what they want, it'll yeah. be by chance, not by choice. Yeah, precisely. You, you, you know, what do we do in life that does not contain uncertainty? I mean, we even talked this podcast, and I prepared the podcast. You prepared. You know, we talked, but we had no idea how this was going to go. We had, we had. No. You know, we it it could have been a blank page. You know, we could have just not connected, and but but that didn't prevent either one of us from jumping into this, you know, unknown situation. There was, you know, I, I, I want to tell a little, a little story and then, and then get your feedback and we will wrap it up. But there is a, um, a podcast that I think it's called design matters with a marketer mm-hmm. called, uh, Debbie Millman. Yep. And Debbie is also an adjunct college professor and she has all of her students at some time or another go through an exercise and says, I want you to take a look at the next five to ten years. You pick, you pick the time frame, five to ten years. And if you had 100% guarantee that you would accomplish this and that there is no chance of failure, what would your life look like in five to ten years? So, so she, she removes the uncertainty factor, and she, yeah. she removes the factor of, you know, influence from peers and society and all our cultural norms. And she said, and then when she comes back years later, people are shocked when they wrote that down, just writing that down and said what they were going to do, how much of that actually came true. Because, oh. because they looked at it not... Not from a fear-based, not from a fear-based sort of frame of mind, and a a restrictive frame of mind, but in just pure pleasure. If 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 I could be this, and and it's you know, and it's not as it, it's, when we say pleasure, you know, I'm I, I know you're a Stoic, but I'm I'm, I'm a Stoic, but I'm also a, a big fan of Epicurus and. Yeah. And when people understand what Epicurus is about, he's not about debauchery and, you know, and sex and drugs and rock and roll. That Epicurus just simply wanted <laughs> you to enjoy what you have in the simplest form, 
and and to count that as a privilege and you know and i i've fallen in love with epicurus as well and and i think that 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 is so much of what our life is about is enjoyment and and not to be afraid it is not a lesser thought or a sin or some kind of maladapted approach to just truly enjoy and take and take joy in the joy you know not to <laughs> not not to not to say oh my goodness i'm just thinking of myself you know i'm i'm, I'm being so selfish no i i think that is far from selfishness oh yeah i think so too did you have a question specifically you wanted no, me to? No, there was no question. It was just a statement. If you wanted to respond, that would be fine, you know? Yeah. I, I the, the One of my favorite things I've heard about Stoicism, because, you know, the person who is not familiar with Stoicism usually just thinks of somebody devoid of emotion. Um, far from it. But, yeah, so far from it. Um, I would find, I think that, as a Stoic or as a person who like relates to Stoicism a lot, and it's because it's so helpful in getting through adversity. Um, I can enjoy everything, but not think that my joy is attached to those things. If that makes sense. Oh like my I goodness, can be, that's brilliant. That makes perfect sense. Yes. Yeah. I can be so happy if I choose to be, while going through adversity, for example, one thing, you know, when my friend died that I mentioned, I was so sad when he died, but had I not known him and made such a close connection with him over my life, I would have never experienced this sadness. Like the, the reason I was so sad was because we were so close. And what am I going to do? Just not make any more friends because I know that Someday they'll lose me or I'll lose them. But I get to be happy even in the sadness because I knew what I risked. I knew that I risked being this sad because I chose to have a friend that good. You know, California, we have to deal with traffic. Well, yeah, but I get to be in 80-degree weather all the time. So if I'm stuck in traffic, I can be super happy because, hey, I chose to do this so that I could live in a place that I really wanted to live. You can have that joy, but don't, and you can be joyful because of externals, but I think stoicism and I think life is just choosing to be happy, but not to tie it specifically to an external thing. I think if if the more you realize that it's an internal choice, the more you will find satisfaction and bravery and courage in your life. And and the more you'll say what you really want to say to the people that you care about or to people that need to be told <laughs> off as well. That also goes along with it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, yeah. You know, I think I think the one, one, one thing we'll, we agree with, I mean, we not one thing, of the many things <laughs> that we agree with, is that part of wisdom, and I, it's written, it's a, it's a quote by somebody, but... But I, I so concur, and it's the ability to hold two opposing truths at the same time, two opposite yeah. truths, you know, the paradox of two mm-hmm. opposite truths, because, because two opposing things can actually be true at the same time. And, yeah. and, and I think that's, that's some of, of what you're describing is that... that I, I and, and another thing that we could talk about is attachment and detachment. I'm I'm strongly about detachment from from things that are holding me back or even moving me forward that I need not be attached. I need to de- need to be detached yet fully enjoy. But that's a whole other show and <laughs> I care not to get in no, I would love to get into that, but our show is over. So, um Nate Johnson, you have been awesome and and I just want to thank you so much for spending time with me today. Um, I love your approach to living adventurously. Now, I'll put it in the show notes, but let's just say it on the show. How how do people get in touch with you? 
Uh, they can get in touch with me on LinkedIn. It's just Nate Johnson. I think it's LinkedIn, Nate Dash Johnson. That's one of them. Uh, they can also email me directly, Nate at Nate Johnson dot coach, not dot okay. com, but dot coach. I Nate didn't know there was a dot coach. coach. I love that. That's that is, yeah. that is great. <laughs> hey, buddy, thank you so much for being on the show with me. I, I, I really appreciate it, man. Thank you, Charlie. This is a, a highlight of my week, so I'm so, so oh, glad that we met each it. other and so glad we got to do this show. That's so kind of you. Thank you. And and I also want to thank all of our listeners for tuning in to The Next Chapter with Charlie. And uh, please be sure to check us out at our website, thenextchapter.life, L-I-F-E. And as always, until next, this is Charlie Hedges signing off. Bye for now.